Welcome back to Money Mastery with Marshy. This is your host, Daniel Marshall, and we are up to episode number 15 of the podcast. And also, Happy New Year, because as of recording right now, it's actually not 2024, but the date this is released is the 1st of January, 2024. So Happy New Year. Hope you've had an incredible festive season. And today, to kick off the podcast for 2024, I'm joined by a friend of mine, an incredible friend, an incredible property coach who's an absolute gun in the property space. Uh, we connected probably maybe two years ago through a mutual, another mutual friend, actually, Brian, who we had on SJ recently. And this girl is just a powerhouse in this space and her story is inspiring. And I can't wait to unpack Liv's journey with you guys here today. So Liv Ward, welcome to Money Mastery with Marshy. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Marshall. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk all things money and mastering it. Let's go deep, shall we? Yeah, absolutely, Liv. And the thing I love about you, Liv, is you're just such a down-to-earth Aussie chick and you just make it, you make this stuff seem easy and you make it seem reachable, in reach for everyday Australians, which is so important because I think, you know, traditionally in the finance world, it just feels so far away from people. You know, there's people in fancy suits and sometimes just for the everyday Australian who wants to build some wealth and some passive income, you know, it, it feels unreachable. But for you, Liv, I love that you're making it easy for Aussies and helping Aussies build a, you know, a property portfolio so that they can create financial freedom and leave their career earlier than they want to and really live a life that is juicy. So thanks for being here. You are welcome. You're welcome. Um, it's my absolute pleasure. And hopefully there's some golden nuggets that are quite a few golden nuggets that people can take away from this. I'm sure there's going to be plenty, Liv. So... Where I want to kick this off today, Liv, is I want you to take us back. Take us back to when you... Well, actually, before I take you back, let me just give you some context, Liv. So I always talk about money mastery is the journey of self-mastery. And for most right. people, there's, there's, a, there's a moment or there's a decision that takes place when they go on this journey. Mm. And Brad Sugars, who I often say this, you know, he says, it takes 10 years to master your money, but poverty and middle class takes forever. Oh. Yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? Touche. So, so what I want to know, Liv, is when was the moment for you? When did you start going on this new journey to where you are here today? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Awesome questions. So I think there was two big pivotal moments when I was, or three, three big pivotal moments that happened slowly but compounded over time in my youth that yeah. motivated me as such. It was my, it was my push so I heard from the, is it the LMP, uh, is it LMP, NLP, NLP world, um, yeah. who taught me that we are, our brains are wired to move more away from pain than move towards pleasure. And I had to actually, I really, that really became true for me today when I, uh, this year, 2023, when I reached a comfort level. And when I look back at all of the things that motivated me, <laughs> It was a pain I was running away from. And so those milestones to answer your question, one was when I was 15, when my parents divorced and I had all the nice things and then I lost it all in a moment, right? I had the comfort, I had the security and I had this niceness that everything was okay financially and then everything became not okay. Literally overnight, lost my family home, my parents lost everything, business, the lot. It was a disaster, caught, most horrible divorces that you can think of, right? So experience, and I ended up living in a caravan, by the way, when I was 15, right? So went from a nice, humble home, aunties, uncles, everyone around, support to losing everything. So that was episode one. What happened to your mindset then? Because that's a pretty big thing for a 15-year-old to go through. What, what did that do to yeah. your mindset at 15 years of age? Um. I became into a, I, I got into like a scarcity sort of mindset that pushed me to say, oh, well, I'm not going to repeat the things that my parents did. That was essentially it because I'm like, they went through a divorce and lost it all. And okay, we all know that you can lose everything through divorce. Um, however, my dad was actually a bit of a serial entrepreneur, believe it or not. Um, but he just didn't have his money right, right? He was really good at making it but he wasn't good at manage, managing it and he wasn't good at multiplying it. What you teach, Marshall, right? Absolutely. So he had all these successful businesses, but he'd blow it away. And I'm like, I just thought to myself, imagine if 
he was good at managing it and multiplying it. The divorce and losing everything wouldn't have been so rough on everyone um, because he liked buying all the nice things. And I liked those nice things as a kid too. I had a pretty financially, it was a pretty good upbringing, right? I had all the nice things. Um, so we didn't go without. But then when I went without and it all got taken away, I was like, oh, I liked those nice things. I don't want it taking away from me again. So that was one thing and the control aspect. So I know this, it's probably one of my shadow words, but that's okay. I've done a lot of work on this is the word control. So um, something that I've worked heavily on within myself personally and done a lot of personal work that I saw, and this is another reason why I'm really um, all about women and empowerment <clears throat> because my mother had no knowledge of anything and she's unfortunately one of the, the stats in today's world where um, I don't know if you know this, but 50 um, the largest cohort of uh, homeless people in the world are women over the age of 50. Did you know that? Really? Wow. No, I yeah. Didn't. Women in, so women in their 50s are the largest cohort of, of uh, homeless people. So they're basically couch surfing. Um, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because a lot of back then, a lot of mothers are, are at home, raising the children, don't build up super, not necessarily income earner, and then go through divorce when they when the kids leave the, the nest egg. That's quite a common thing that's happening. So anyway, so my mum became one of those. And when I saw my mum at 16, I had to help my mum work out some basic stuff because she had to move into a house all on her own for the first time. But she, my mum, so I will also use this as well. My mum comes from a family where there's um, there's some learning difficulties and challenges there. So my mum didn't have a basic concepts of setting up stuff for life. So I um, remember we, she moved into her first house on her own. I was 16 and she didn't have like the water, gas, electricity or anything connected. She just didn't know why it wasn't working. And I was like, mom, it's because you've got to connect all this stuff. But she just didn't know. It. She's like, oh, how do you do these things? And I was like, whoa, my mum has no idea about basic stuff. That you can just Google something. So that impacted me as well to become a knowledgeable and empowered woman as well. Um, so all of those things, yeah, compounded at such an early age for me because I was like, I don't want to end up like this. Um, yeah. So, yeah, big, big pivotal moments it's for me, watching my mum go through that and the emotional of, like, losing everything. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, so the seeds were planted for right there at 15, 16 of losing, yeah, the, the divorce, the separation plus seeing your mum not having some of that basic knowledge you, you really wanted to to change the game and to rewrite your history. Yep. Yep. Amen. Seeds are planted. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then the next thing was, but I didn't do anything about it. Right? I was still a kid. I was just going through the motions, but it was planted in there like, like a rock, like a memory I couldn't let go of. <clears throat> and then when I was 19, so mind you, I was a year 10 high school dropout right? Um, I was very dyslexic, had age teachers, all this sort of stuff growing up. And my parents would always fight about me staying down in school because teachers were like, she's got to stay down. She cannot go up. Like she can't continue. And my parents are like, would fight about whether or not they should do that or what. And that was every single year. So I just got used to, in my mind, listening to my parents and everyone argue about how uh, I struggled in school and how I wasn't going to excel in life. But then on the other end, I had my mum, she used to say this one thing to me all the time, which still stuck to me today. And this is a form of manifestation that I swear to God has also gotten to me to where I am today. And she would just say to me one sentence, and that was, oh, sweetie, you can do and have anything that you want. And she would just repeat that one sentence to me. You can do anything you want. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of embedded into me that I believe that. Do you know in um you know the book oh. Thinking Grow Rich? You would know this. Yeah. Who's the who's the kid in the story where his mum where the school kicked him out uh, because he wasn't good enough? But the mum just said, "Oh, you got kicked out because you were too smart." Who was that? Yeah, I can't, I can't. I do remember the story, but I can't remember who the kid and who it was. Yeah, yeah, I think it was Thomas Thomas Edison or something. Um, the guy who created the light bulb. <clears throat> so that was me. And I realized, I was like, my mum was over here saying, oh, you can do and be anything you want. And I don't even think she realized how powerful that was. <laughs> it was just like, That's you can be mine. 
that's crazy because obviously you were saying just before how your mum was struggled with some of those basic uh, things to do, you know, like how to turn on electricity and gas and stuff. But at the same time, maybe unconsciously was planting this very powerful seed into you because language is so powerful that you can do and have and be anything. That's that's incredible because that is that's a gift right there. Yeah. That is a gift. I'm so grateful every day that my mum has told me that. And I repeat, I, all the time I speak, I jump on the phone with mum. I'm like, mum, you realise that that one sentence, I tell her and I remind her. Um, so, yeah, that was extremely powerful. So, year 10 high school dropout, right? Um, and then, so my family were like, well, what else are you going to do? They're like, you're going to have to just, just go get a job, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, my dad is just like, you know, just become a nurse. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll just go do nursing. Um, and then, Clearly, I could not pass the exams because I couldn't read or write. So I couldn't even read the questions on the exam. So I, there's no way in chance. I could I could do the physical stuff. Anyway, so I'm doing my, um, we call it like your placements. You have to do hours in nursing. And so this is the next pivotal moment in my life. So I'm like 18 or 19 and I'm in nursing homes. And like you, Marsha, you're so good at interviewing people. And I always had this curiosity of interviewing people as well. So from a young age, I was always asking old people, my grandparents but when I got to this nursing home I was always asking old people the purpose of life and you know what would you do uh more of what would you have done less of if you could repeat you'd go back to time what would you you know all those sort of things and they all repeated the same things they said try and uh, be as present as possible um network as much as possible um go out there and live in trouble and um and don't swap your time for money so much and I was like, work out how to make money so that you could be more present. And I was like, right. And I'm sitting there and then I'll go into the next sec- next area of old people. I'm sitting there spoon feeding them. So this is where like they're done. They're at the, the last days. They can't even feed themselves. And I was like, they're all these old wise people. People are like literally telling you, creating a path of how to do life easier. How to win it. That's so and good. I was like, That's so good. I'm just going to do this. <laughs> so that was the next plant that was seeded at around 18, 19. Yeah. I, yes. I didn't know that part of your story, but that's so powerful. So you, you kind of fell into nursing and you had this opportunity to speak to all these people at the end of their life. And the, the secret that you said there was curiosity because you, you know, curiosity mm-hmm. is one of the ingredients to success, asking lots of questions. And you were just literally getting these gifts from people who have such different perspective on life. Yeah. And you were take, taking that on board and more seeds were being planted into how to live a successful life. Yeah. So be curious. So from then, okay, so some big seeds have been planted already. What yeah. happened from that? So having all these conversations with these people in the, in the nursing home, what then happened in your life? Okay, so then I went to an extreme and thought, sweet, I'm going to blow all my money and really live life to the extreme. So I moved back home. So I was renting at the time, moved back home with my mom, and then um, I blew all my money, my wage. And mind you, I'm at this point in my life, I'm working at Optus as a call centre. So I was doing sales, by the way, what one of the biggest skills um, that I think you need for business. Um, and I did sales jobs from about 16 all the way up until I was 26. So for the first 10 years of my entire working career was just sales. Um, but anyway, so I would blow that money on, I had a target, which was to complete everything on adrenaline.com. So I wanted to really live life to the fullest, right? Complete everything yeah. on this thing. And I did it. It was like, I had a bucket list of like 30 things before I'm 30. And I completed it all by like 23 or 24. And I was like, now what? So I'd done all that. What were some the of the things and what were the adrenaline things? Oh, oh, everything. Um, I really like things like car speed, cars and water based things. Um, so the jet packing thing that goes above the water, I really like that one oh, yeah. so hard. Um, I loved anything to do with cars. And so because of that, I then actually got into doing, completing all the uh, advanced driving courses around Australia and then, um, and then because I love the adrenaline as well, that was a bit of the rush for me. Uh, but then I really enjoyed um, doing stunt driving and I actually became and completed a stunt driving course. So I became a certified stunt driver, which is pretty cool. So I got a certificate for that. That was awesome. Cool. So yeah, a couple of cool things so in there. Jumped out on, so, so you jumped out on the adrenaline and then what happened? And then, so I'm doing the adrenaline stuff, finished it. Oh, then about 23, the next pivotal moment. 
finance, money came into it again. My mum came home one day and sat me down and said, oh, I just spoke to a financial planner. Um, and basically the end result is I'm going to have to work every day until I'm 70, until I can't move. And then I was like, oh, my mum is financially screwed. So my mum's still renting, no, zero assets. And because my parents were entrepreneurs, they had small businesses, never paid themselves super, right? So they are like broke as hell at this point, right? And so for me, I had this light bulb moment of like, oh, fuck. Uh, my mother is either A, going to have to live with me for the rest of my life and I'm going to have to financially support her or B, I have to work out how to make money to support her so that, uh, bless my mum, but I also don't want her to have to live with me for the rest of my life. I want to potentially have my own family. Um, so that was the next big pivotal moment. And I didn't know anyone um, who was wealthy in my life, but there was just this gut instinct this gut thing I can't explain it other than just this intuition that I knew that like okay well people talk about real estate all the time and it seems like you don't need to have a qualification to do real estate so I'm just going to somehow work that out <clears throat> people make money through real estate and actually there was this one guy there's this one guy who probably actually now that I think about it he did plant the seed a lot <clears throat> and he was my team leader at Optus he was an immigrant um, from Egypt and he was a taxi driver to begin with and then became a team leader at Optus, only earning like 70 grand a year, right? And he had five kids, five kids, immigrant who moved here in his 30s, early 30s, who had nothing and he owned five properties. And I was like, how did this father with a wife at home and five kids, so he has five, six, seven mouths to feed, He's only on 70 grand a year. How on earth did he build five properties all in Melbourne, mind you, right? So not like cheap areas either. How on earth did this guy do it? And so he would do these things in our sales meetings where he would um, use the sales meetings to motivate us to build property. So he would run little property stuff in our sales. When it was meant to be sales, he'd be like, Shh, don't tell the call center managers, but let's go in here in our 15 minute sales meeting every morning. He would teach us a little hack about property. No one else in that room gave a rat's ass except for me. Everyone else was like, oh, this is boring. Don't want to learn about property. Teach me about how to make more money in sales, right? Whereas I was like, I would then stay behind and ask him more questions about how he did property. Um, yeah, so that was another seed that planted in my mind around 23. So, okay, so you're about 23. You're working at Optus in a sales role. Would you yeah. say this fella, would he have been your... You know, maybe first mentor, perhaps. Correct. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I call him my sensei. Um, he was a very, very humble man, very quiet. Um, but he was like in calls. This is so bad. I can't believe I'm about to say this. But we would literally, so bad, we would put customers on hold and be like, sorry, man, just got to put you on hold. Got a, got, a, um, got a bit of a problem. And I'd go over quickly and then ask him about a property question whilst I've got a customer waiting on the line. So I'd be like, I just had this question about property. What about this? <laughs> and he would draw up and we'd have whiteboards and stuff going. And he loved helping me and teaching me, um, mm -hmm. I think because I was the only one that was showing um, interest in it. So yeah, he was definitely my first mentor and first sensei. I call him. I, his name was Mister Mister um, Muhammad. It was his last name, um, and I was always like, Mister Muhammad, what are we going to learn about real estate today? <laughs> um, but I only had him for about six months that I could really learn. But I went hard during that period. Um, okay. So yeah, the first okay. guy. So at twenty, so that's the kind of the third seed, Mister Muhammad at twenty three at Optus, teaching you about property. You were leaning into it. Obviously, some of the seeds that had already been planted when you were 16, 19 were there. Mm -hmm. And perhaps you probably saw this as a way a way out. Yeah. An answer to your questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, so I'm gonna find like buy like the first property or whatnot. But what I know today is the way that he did it was more the harder way. So I don't teach what he taught me. So it's it's not the same formula. However, at what what he did worked for him. It's more the hustle sort of way. So he like he renovated most properties. I've never renovated a property, for example, right? He did the old school yeah. buy it, um, what we call manufacture equity, the hard way. Um, yeah. So of course he was an immigrant, right? So they like hustle through that, um, and that is the most typical way that most people do it. So yes, that's where the plant really seeded for me. Um, so that got me motivated to save for my first property. 
because before that I ha hated saving money. I still do hate saving money. I like making more. It's easier. Um, so yeah, I didn't like saving it. Um, okay. And, and what I learned then as well was bring down the savings time frame as well. So he taught me that. So he's like, um, he taught me a little bit about compounding. So he's like, you know, if you reach your first, if you're going to go save your first property in my mind, I was like, Oh, I can save for the first, my first deposit in three, three years. But then he challenged me to say, well, I'd like you to think about how you could save it and bring it down in 12 months. I said, so is it, he goes, how could you? And I got into always thinking, how can I bring everything down? How can I collapse time? Um, I love that. And so it got me opened up my mind to think about what were the possibilities? What else could I sacrifice to reach that goal a little bit earlier? Okay, so tell us about tell us about that then. Like the journey you've, you've learned from Mr. Muhammad, he's given you all this wisdom, um, mm -hmm. getting you to think differently about the time it takes to reach your goals. Tell us about that journey to getting the money together for your first property. Tell us about that. Yeah, Marshy, I um, I sacrificed a lot, right? Um, I probably sacrificed a little bit of my health because I can tell you what, right now, I um, I ate two-minute noodles and migraine. Specifically, I ate <laughs> migraine with a dollop of uh, peanut butter, and I'll never forget those moments. Every time when I look at walk past the migraine aisle at the Coles or Woolies, and I think to myself, that migraine got me to where I am today. <laughs> with a, my, and all my Asian and Filipino friends at Optus, they're like, live, 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 you're doing migraine wrong. You've got to add the peanut butter. And I'll be like, okay, <laughs> I'll do that. Make it to sauté. So, yeah, so migraine, I sold my car. I walked to the train and I caught the train every single day to work. I moved back to my mum and I said, mum, can you please let me live here rent free? So, yes, I had that leg up, right? Um, and in this house, I'll never forget, and I stayed there in this house, this house, even till today, it was the, I would say 95% of people that I know in Australia, um, would not live in this house. It was disgusting. And it still is till today. It was covered in mold. The whole entire house was due to break down. It was not livable. <clears throat> um, there was no air con during uh, summer and there was zero heating during Melbourne's really, really cold, uh, cold, cold winters. And I stayed there and I did not move out until property number five. And I just remember yeah. saying to my partner at the time, I was like, babe, we bought one. And I said, okay, we're just going to, we're not going to live in that house. And my partner was like, what do you mean? I said, we're going to be rent investors. We're not going to live in it because it's smarter not to live in, live in any house that you own actually. And then my partner was like, we've got to get out of this. We can't live in this. And mind you also, there was some issues inside the household as well. And on top of that, so it's like my brother and my mom and whatnot. And my partner moved in as well. So I was so grateful to have that opportunity. Um, and next door was what we called the local uh, cookhouse. It was so bad. It was the, the local drug dealer of the area who was making drugs for the area. So the cops were always there, shining in my bedroom window, and there was like crazy um, drug addicts next door screaming at the top of their lungs nearly every week, waking me up on a Tuesday night. I just hear screaming. She would, the neighbor, the woman would like be lying on the road being like, run me over, run me over. And the husband or the partner would be in the car revving, just being like, so I lived in like a crazy area. And I remember one night, it was like three nights in a row, and I was like, I'm done, I can't sleep, I'm trying to hustle, save, um, getting up, going to work, doing overtime, all of this sort of stuff. And I nearly ran out to the road to like interrupt and be like, shut the fuck up. My brother was like, <laughs> pulled me. He's like, don't go out there, they're crazies. You don't want to do that. They're addicts and you don't want to get involved. I was like, okay, no worries. Pull your ego aside, Olivia. And um, so those moments, even till today, remind me of like the hustle that we went through in the first three to five years. Um, it was hard to push through because the easiest thing to do, the easy thing to do would have been to do what everyone else did, which was go and live in that first house that I built, which is a really brand, which is a brand new build. Um, that could have been the most easiest thing to do, but we didn't and we stuck to it. Um, yeah. and we would just freeze our asses off. I couldn't even sleep at night. I just remember it was so cold because there was no heating in our house. It would freeze to death. Um, yeah. So those are some of the things that I just remember sacrificing in the early stages to save that deposit. That's, that's incredible. And I feel like you've got to sacrifice something early on in your journey to, to if you, if you're really serious, you do have to make sacrifices mm -hmm. and I feel like 
so many people say they want all these things in life, but they're not willing to pay the price, not willing to make those sacrifices in the early days, which you clearly do. I mean, selling your car, living in that house that 95% of people wouldn't live in, you know, living off uh, noodles or mega rings or whatever. Like, they're big sacrifices. And Liv, I'm, I'd love to know just for some perspective, like mm. how much did you need to save up? How quickly did you do it? And how much were you earning at the time? Just so people can hear some of this perspective. Yeah, it's very, very good to know this. I was earning 55 grand a year as a call center worker at Optus. Mm -hmm. um, my partner was on 50 grand a year. Um, so it's not like we were on a large amount of money. Uh, we also had a lot of, I had over $50,000 of personal debt as well, just to let you know. Okay. I had racked up this huge, disgusting, I had a personal loan and a car loan, a dumb, dumb car which I went out and bought uh, that I ended up selling to try and get ahead. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't starting off. I wasn't starting off from a very good position either, right? Um, and I even remember this one time I got a chest freezer so I could bulk make my food and the electricity bill went through the roof and I had to pay for it. It ended up being like a $2,000 electricity bill because we thought it was my broken chest freezer. So anyway, I even remember that broke me nearly. Um, I nearly gave up because of that, that chest freezer, that electricity yes. bill. Yeah, because my mum couldn't afford it. I had to pay for it. Yep, I did. So I collapsed time. 42 grand was what I needed to save. And, just, and I did it in less than 12 months. Right? Cool. So, yeah. That's in, and you are only earning 55K a year and you did, saved up 42K in less than 12 months. Yeah, between my partner and I. And that was also save, cool. selling my car as well. Like that helped boost that a little bit, right? Um, but I had that $50,000 debt though for that car. It was like not uh, plus the personal loan as well. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, forty-two thousand dollars, which is what. So that hence the reason why collapsing that time, I sacrificed all that because I was like, this pain isn't, you know, um, mm. was um, something I wanted to move through, and I used that pain to be like, I'm never going to live this again. So I'm not going to put myself in this situation again. Um, so yeah, so that's how much I saved uh, to get started, and that was it. And that's usually the hardest part for most people. I think that's it's really important for people to hear that part of the story as well because mm -hmm. sometimes people look at the end result like all these properties or all this success and they forget about the origins of the journey Correct. and where you started and you know like and that just shows that anyone can do it you know 55k a year plus your partner it's not a huge amount of income but the biggest thing is like if you want it bad enough you'll pay the price and you'll make the sacrifices like you did yeah and i genuinely think it was because of the pain and i genuinely think that people are too comfortable in today's society it's not enough to move them out from where they are. They say they want $100,000 of passive income. I'm like, these are the things you can do to get to it at the start, but are you willing to do it? Yeah. 100%. 100%. So, okay, well, Liv, tell us, because I know this journey, so you were working at Optus, you got the first property through that sacrifice, and you were still living in that kind of rundown place until you had, was it five properties? Yes. So. Um, I bought my fifth one and then moved out. Yep. Okay. Now, what did, like... What were you studying? What were you learning to get to this point? Because I'm sure you don't just go out there and, and you start uh, building a beast property portfolio. Like you've got to be learning and studying. Tell us about what you were doing in the early days to to build your knowledge, to build your experience and wisdom in this space. Short answer is I went tunnel focused on YouTube. Nearly everything you want to know today or you want to do or a skill you want to learn, you can virtually learn for free on YouTube. <laughs> um, so when I thought about property, the pivotal moment was, was I was building this, I bought this first house, which was a build and I don't teach anyone to do this. This is not the way that I, even though I did do really well, new builds typically don't work out. I was just lucky. Honestly, in that moment, I didn't smart. I didn't choose a really good property. I didn't have a formula for that first one. Um, I just went out and bought a property and it just happened to grow in value by $200,000 by the time, the day after it settled, bought the land, found a builder by the time it settled. And I got a bank evaluation and the next day, literally the next day it settled up 200,000. And I was like, holy fuck, I think I've won the lotto. I need to do something. <laughs> with this money. Um, yeah. I was like, I know I can do something with it, but I don't, I don't know how. And so even the, um, I'd lost the, the sensei, he'd gone. So I couldn't really lean on him. Um, mm. But also I kind of knew that like he was doing, I don't know, some sort of intuition told me, I'm like, surely there's an easier way what he told me to do the hustle way surely there's an easier way and i didn't know anyone else in my life at all who had owned more than one or two properties like no one yeah. so i went onto youtube and i literally typed in i can't remember what i typed in actually just typed in something how to build wealth through property 
uh, and then I looked and I looked and I scaled for some for some a couple of videos and I finally found a guy where I'm like, yeah, this guy makes sense. I like him. Values aligned. He talks my language. He's simplified. He's an Aussie bogan. I was like, like it. So then, and it just so happened, there was no podcast back then, and I literally binged every single YouTube video. I moved on to books every single moment possible. I read every book on property um, that I could get my hands on. So the three hours a day I spent on the train, an hour and a half in, an hour and a half back, I literally watched, uh, read these books or listened to these YouTubes. I also listened to a lot of motivational hustle sort of masculine sort of videos. So every day that was that was the planting the seed to get my mindset ready as well, to be like, you've got this, motivate, push through, blah, blah, blah. I even still listen to those videos till today in the shower every morning whilst I'm having a cold shower. Um, Caleb, is there a particular favorite? Is there a particular favorite from those motivational ones? No, I literally just type in morning motivational speeches yeah. into YouTube, okay. done. And I just listen to them in the background. And it just plants seeds early on in the day. That's it. Yeah. Um, and so I would listen to that for about two minutes when I, I plan to be like, right, I'm getting off the train and I'm hustling and I'm moving to my work and I, I would fast speed walk to my work every single day. It was a 15 minute walk and I just listened to that motivational stuff. And I'm like, that got me into my sales role for the day. Um, and that would get me into reading books. And then every, and then what I would do is, is I'd use the time. So here we go. Here's another thing that I also did is I used my job at Optus, the career to learn different skills. Now, I didn't know that I would need that the importance of learning those skills. So I, I was like, I'm not using this job for an income to swap my money for time. I'm using it to help me outside of this. So I specifically chose a job at Optus. I ended up moving out of sales, which is on the phone. And I had specifically to get a back end job that wasn't talking to people. Um, became an MBM provisioner so that I could sit there and do my job in the first three hours of my day and then I'll use the last five hours of my shift to then watch YouTube videos on real estate. My boss would come in and check. It was a bit of micromanagement. Like, how are you going today, Liv? And I'm like, oh, yeah, cool, at lunchtime. Oh, yeah, I'm halfway through. Yep, yep, yep. And he's like, okay, good work. I was already completed. I was watching YouTube videos <laughs> in real estate. So I used that to learn, to compound. So I'm compounding my time and taking the most amount of advantage that I could of my time. Um, cause that's typically what you, what you, when you're at starting off, if you've got no money, you've typically got time, but then if you've, if you've got money, you typically have like no time. And so I just yeah. used my time a lot, compounded that as much as very, I could to just learn. Yeah. Very smart. Very smart. Mm -hmm. And you know, Jim Rohn always says that live or he, when he was living that you've, you got to work full time on your job, but part time on your fortune. So what you were doing during that time, like you were. You're working full time, you know, to pay the bills to get the the capital for your first property, and then you're working part time on your fortune. Yeah, I didn't know that. There you go. See, sometimes I don't even know that like I'm making smart moves or I'm doing the the right things until you articulate it for me. Wow. Yeah, no, they were very smart moves, and I think that's. I think if you're in a job, if you can smash out your work in a few hours like you did, then you've got the time to actually to work on your fortune or to work on the passion area or to, to build whatever it is you want to build as well. And I think that was super smart what you were doing back then. Yeah. Very smart. Yeah. And it also helped me in business too. Since mm. I left, since I left my nine to five job, all the skills that I got at Optus, I intentionally did that to learn different area. I moved up, I kept moving and moving, not necessarily up actually, just moved to the side, just move into different areas. Cause they'll be like, okay, I've done this for 18 months now. I was at Optus for 12 years. I'm like, okay, I've done this for 18 months now, move on to the next area, move on to the next area to learn different stuff. Um, yeah. So, okay. That, that helps so, mm. so you went beast mode on self-education, just literally on the train, the motivational stuff at work. When you'd finish your work, you were listening to the YouTube videos, watching the YouTube videos. Yeah. Like at, at what stage then? Because obviously you got that first property, you've got that extra 200K like overnight valuation. Mm. Like how long was it before you got to property number two? What was that next step for you? Because that's probably a big next step. That was a huge, you're right. It was actually one of the biggest pivotal moments of my life. So then I remember thinking, okay, what am I going to do with this 200 grand? So I've got this mm -hmm. random guy that I'm learning on YouTube that says, go basically buy cheaper properties, go I, to go option one to listen to him, which would be go buy cheaper properties, not necessarily in areas people would feel comfortable with. Uh, but areas where like 
you know, basically regional areas in, in, in the Bronx, basically, um, that would have like higher yields. So I could buy two of them. Or uh, then I then remember sending a text message to a bunch of, um, let's just think of like uncles and aunties, people I kind of looked up to, actually weren't really successful in property, but just bought and sold a lot of houses. And I asked them the same question. Hey, if you had this money, would you go and buy one house uh, by the beach in Frankston? This is in Melbourne at the time. Um, which is a pretty well-known area in Melbourne, right? Up and coming sort of area. Or would you go buy two out in this bronchi area? And all six people said, go buy the one in Frankston in the up and coming area. And that would have been what we call negatively geared, that property. But the other version would have been what we call positive geared. And in that moment in time, it's the most pivotal moment, I remember I couldn't sleep at night for like a week. And I was like, which one do I do? Which one do I do? Which one do I do? And my partner just said, Babe, it was at like two o'clock in the morning. She's like, why aren't you sleeping? And I'm like, I don't know which one to do. And my partner was like, well, the other six people, they haven't achieved what we want to achieve. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to follow my intuition, follow this random guy on YouTube that I haven't actually met. <laughs> and so he was the one who'd got to 70 properties by the age of 27. So I'm bloody hell going to listen to him. And so I did that. And that was the biggest pivotal moment of my life. So then I went and bought two properties straight away out in this regional area. And those were till today the best properties I've ever bought in my life, in my portfolio. And the okay, and the, I guess the important thing there, Liv, as well, is those two properties might not have looked great, like face value, but you're saying they were cash flow positive rather than negatively geared. So they were making money versus the nice one was losing money. Correct. They are the most ugliest, hideous properties I have in my property to, in my portfolio till today. Um, mm -hmm. But they are in the best areas. They've had the most amount of percentage in capital growth. They've had the most amount of percentage in uh, rental growth. They have the most, um, uh, they, ha they have tenants. My tenants that are in there are um, nearly on the dole. One of them is actually like on cent fully on Centrelink. Um, and yeah, they're the best. It I wouldn't live there for sure in that particular area. Uh, but people need to live there and people are moving there. And I just followed the data and I followed the logic of what I learned at that time. And I had to say no. The hardest thing was saying was blocking out the noise from everyone else. If, I remember this other friend that I had, he was a builder. And he said to me, buying a um, buying an established house, an older house, is you're buying somebody else's problem. And I was like, well, I had to block that out. And I was like, no, it's not. What is somebody else's problem is somebody else's opportunity. Um, and it was an opportunity for me. So that was really hard was to block out everyone else's opinions who weren't successful in where I wanted to go. Mm. That probably is, that is probably the, one of the hardest things on anyone's pursuit, no matter what vehicle or journey you choose, it's blocking out those opinions and just really backing yourself and trusting yourself and trusting the mentors that you're listening to because they're the ones that have the results. Yeah. Amen. And it's great that you were able, able to be courageous enough to back yourself and back your own judgment. Yeah. And I think that part was to come from the the confidence of the work that I'd done. So like the knowledge gave me that confidence to say, no, I've, I know the numbers. I know the data. I know how it works. So I had that to back my confidence in myself. And then also those motivational videos that I was listening to every morning, just for 10, 15 yeah. minutes. Yeah. And that's it. You got to, you got to program your mind for success. You got to program your mind I'm the same, Liv, like for, for years and years, like probably 10 years now, I've been programming my mind like with the similar stuff to you just to, because because we're from a young age, we're programmed and conditioned by movies, by TV, by society to be poor, essentially, like we are. And we need to, we need to be planting these seeds in our, in our brain every day. So if, if you're listening to this as well, make sure you're planting those seeds every single day to rewire your mind for success and to think differently about money and wealth and life. Yeah. It's so important. Yeah, amen. There's, and you know what else? As you've actually just said that, Marcia, I realized something else that you could do and I that helped me was I, because I was obsessed with fast cars, I used to go and test drive really nice cars. But in order to do that, they wanted to make sure, um, here's a little hack for you, what I would do is I would go and grab, test drive a, a, like a little bit of an upgrade to a car that I had, right? I would drive in and be like, oh, this is the one that I've got. I want to, can I test drive one of these ones? Sure. Then I'd grab that test drive car and I'd go to the next car yard, 
to the next, like the next upgrade from there. And then I'd say, oh, this is the car that I've got. I want to upgrade from this. A <laughs> um, little bit of a white lie, but YOLO. That's how I got to then have the taste of the nicer things so I could visualise what it was like having and feeling and touching the nicer things that I desired in the future as well. That That's was a awesome. very powerful hack. Uh, and I've often read about that strategy as well, Liv, where people, you, I mean, even if you don't have the money yet, you can still immerse yourself in environments where who you want to become, like that's the people there. Like you can go to an expensive hotel and grab a coffee or have a cocktail and still immerse yourself in that experience for less than 20 bucks. Or you could just even literally walk there and spend some time there, people watching. Yeah. And hold oh, nope. themselves. Yes. Go on. But what you just said then, Liv, is um, because I've heard the strategy of like where you'll go and, you know, test drive a car to immerse yourself in the experience. I've never heard someone say you go and test drive a car and then take that test drive car to another place. That's um, that is a new one. I love that. So oh, great. Please. So resource, very resourceful as well. Mm, yeah. And I still do it to da- till today. Um, I think to myself, like there's a yacht yard at the end of my street where I live yeah. and I specifically still live in this area. A lot of my friends in this area are like, surely you don't need to live in this area anymore. It's a, um, <clears throat> but I love it because I'm like, now nah, the yacht yard's at the bottom of my street. I get to hang out and look at these yachts. Now, there's a part of me I'm just like, yeah, do I one day desire a yacht? I, I know what I'm like. I'll probably have one for like three months and get bored of it and probably never use it. Um, but the idea of just walking around it, I walk on the, um, what do you call it, the, the jetties every day, yeah. right? And I just pretend as if like one of them's mine. <laughs> Right? I'm just like, oh, yeah, touch it. Sometimes I sit on the edge of somebody else's yacht and then the owner might walk past and be like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, hey, mate, what's your name? And I'm like, is this your boat? And they're like, yeah. And then I start having conversation conversation with them. Um, yeah. So I even do, do that even till today, surround myself, make it normalised in my mind that these big things are normal. Yeah, and guys, if you listen to that part very carefully as well, that's another big secret that Liv has just dropped here as well, just – making your desired lifestyle feel normal, feel comfortable. And actually mm. brings it, it brings your desired lifestyle to you faster when you can be comfortable with it and feel like that is you already. And you're using your imagination there as well, Liv. It's, you know, you're imagining that it is yours, which is such yeah. a powerful tool that we all have, but we don't all use. Yeah. I didn't realize that I naturally kind of did that my whole life. Like for example, when I was 23, I would have, um, Okay, whether or not this is a good thing or not, I don't know, but it helped me. Um, I would normalize a like a big goal, right? But I would attach some sort of like prob small problem to that goal to make it realistic. So, for example, what I would do is is I would say um, I would say to myself, "Oh, I want to. I am in the top one percent um, prop of property investors in Australia," which means you just get to five properties or more. So I said to myself. I'm in my 20s. I wanted to reach the top 1% of property investors in my 20s. Okay. And then I was going to then label a small, like, little problem with that, right? And so the problem that I then manifested was with that was I'm going to reach that, but then I'm not going to know what to do next, right? And then I'm going to get a little bit stuck in the meantime. Guess what? I manifested that small problem. And I was like, but what a great problem to have. And I literally manifested that into my life. So I reached 29, got to the top 1%, and I was like, for three or six months, I was like, what's the point of life? What's next? I literally manifested that into my life. I told myself that that was a problem I was going to have. And I do even the same thing till today with a yacht, right? Is I say, oh, I'm going to, I'm visualizing myself out on a yacht with my friends, with my entrepreneurial friends. We're all hanging out in the Bahamas and we're talking about businesses and growth and making money and all of the projects that we want to solve for around the world. And we're talking about, yeah, I've got this, big project over in Africa where I'm building this school and blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about it. Let's have this, but let's go set up, set up the big, I don't know why, but I just envision this a slide because I like fun and I like slides into water. And then I envision that I'm having this problem setting up my slide that like it's got a big hole in it. And that my problem that I have to solve for is getting the the hole in the slide fixed. And I was like, that's normal to me. So some so some days I'm like, oh, yeah, how am I going to fix that hole in my slide on my yacht? Like I literally visualise I love, I, love, I love that, yeah, the visualisation, the imagination that you use there as well and the intention setting that you have there, especially that one that you said, you know, I'm a top, was it 5% or 1% property investor? What was the yeah, one that you said? Yeah, property investors, yeah. Now, let me ask you this, Liv. When you started saying that, 
um, back when you were 23 or however, however old, did you know that was going to become a reality at the time? Like within you, could you feel like, did you, did you have that knowingness in you? It was yes, because I was like, I'm just going to reach it. I don't know how I just knew that I was going to get there but I didn't know how I was necessarily going to get there at the start. But then obviously as my education grew and I was delving deeper, yeah, it was like a knowingness. I would be like, I'm going to get there. I'm going to do it. I already am. I'm just visualizing this every single day that this is the thing that I'm living. Okay. Powerful. Uh, And that's a common trait with all the successful people as well. They always, there's, there's a knowingness. There's a knowingness that I'm going to get. I don't know how it's going to look. And that's the difference between goal setting and intentions as well, because what you were setting there, Liv, was actually an intention. It's The intention is, I know this is going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. I'm just going to let the universe, God or whatever, fill in the details for me. But you're operating with a, in a state of knowing rather than when you set a goal and it's like, well, fuck, how am I going to get there? An intention is, you know, you're going to get there and you're not, too, you're not trying to control how to get there. You just trust and know that you're going to get there. Exactly. Amen. Thank you. Hmm. That's exactly what I did. I love that. Powerful. And it makes you more resourcefulness when you can just think, look, I, and just letting go of needing to control how and just letting go and be like, it's just going to come to me. I'm either going to have the resource or the knowledge or something or someone is going to come to me and give me the answer to this next step or this next move. So I wouldn't lose sleep over it. And that it requires a level of faith and trust in things that are bigger than yourself. Hmm. Like to have that, I'm curious for you, Liv, like where did you cultivate your faith or the trust that's required to operate like that? That's a good question. I don't know. I'm going to say there's a level of um, level of confidence within myself though as well that I could attract that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you stunned me on that one, Marshy. I don't know. I think I think a level I think you have to have a level of confidence within yourself but I think it just comes down to my manifestation skills to be honest with you mm-hmm. that I was like my visualization of reaching that goal was so strong that it was if I was reading into my future that painted that picture for me to say well, this is going to happen so who cares about the who, what, where, or how? Okay. So what I'm hearing, Liv, is you, you'd imagined that reality so many times in vivid detail that there was no doubt because you'd already lived it in your mind so many times. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine doing that for everything that you want. <laughs> and that's the thing we can. And even as a kid, like our imagination is so powerful as a kid and and our belief is so powerful but then as we get older we just get it programmed out of us conditioned out of us but you know we, we we lose sight of that power that we have to to imagine to declare what we want and just to trust and to believe that it can happen mm. and i but, feel like you're quite a rare quite a rare person where you've kind you've, you've had that like it i don't know if you've you had that all the way through your teenage years and your 20s or you cultivated it or Okay, I actually do know where this comes from, but I, I didn't want it to be like a limiting belief for other people. Um, yeah. So do you know, what, you know what human design is? You've done a study, Marshy. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about this at some stage, so let's go into it now. Okay, so I think it's because, not I think, I know. So okay. uh, human design is basically an energetic way of like manoeuvring and being able to use more of your own skills and like we all have basically have a superpower. Marsha, you're a projector, is that right? I am, yes. Oi, I love projectors. And I'm a manifester and guess what? Projectors and manifestors are also known to be with some of the best friends in the world as well. So we're meant to be hanging out. Um, that's why we get on. Pardon? That's why we get on so well. Yeah, that's why we get on. So last year, um, it was a pivotal moment, went and got a human design. If you don't know what it is, I highly recommend it. Um, it changed my life a lot, um, empowered me a lot to understand more of my skills, my superpowers, so I could do more of that and let go of the things that I wasn't so good at. Um, mm-hmm. And so what I learned is I am what you call a manifester, born manifester. So we equal 9% of the population. My superpower is to manifest. Mm-hmm. So this is probably the other reason why I was so good at visualization. 
So with manifestors, we're very good at having this knowing about how to do something. It's like this intuition knowing, but we're not very good at explaining or articulating it, um, how we know this thing or educating people. So we're typically people just to, imp we're here to impact um, and show people via, um, by doing the thing. Um, so we're very much the, what you call the fire starters um, in the world. So we're the people here are here to come up with an idea, be the visualization um, and come up with the, yeah, come up with a vision and then just press go and start doing and then lead and then hand it over to somebody else to take care of it and nurse it. Um, mm -hmm. So I truly believe that that's where my natural instincts come from. Now, just because I have that naturally within me, I do believe that what I do is absolutely teachable and coachable though. So it doesn't mean that you can't do it if you're not a manifester. It just means you've just got to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. I just naturally adopt it. I think I was born with it. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Okay. So you're a manifest. And, then, and for you guys, if you haven't heard of human design before, I highly recommend diving into it. Because again, Liv, um, human design really impacted me last year as well when I learned about mine. I was like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. This makes so much sense because I'm a projector and I was always trying to, I was conditioned to operate like a generator thinking I had to do, 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 do. I'm like, how the fuck am I going to ever keep up with these people? But then I learned about the energy type of the projector. I'm like, oh, this makes so much more sense. So it was very liberating for me as it was for you, Liv. So definitely, guys, find out your human design and I highly recommend getting an unpack done by someone. Yeah. Very powerful. I'm reading. 100%. Mm -hmm. How do you, what was the biggest impact it had for you? Well, that was pretty, the big thing for me, Liv, it was the projector versus the generator where the generators are the real doers. So they're the mm -hmm. ones that are taking action. They're in the thick of it. They're doing, doing, doing. And because most of the population are generators, we can get conditioned, you know, manifests and projectors, we can get conditioned to operate like that. So I would always see all these people just killing it on socials, just going, going, going. I'm like, how am I ever going to be successful? There's no way I can keep up with these people. But what I learned with the projector is the projector, we see things differently. We see how to do things more efficiently from a different perspective. The projector is kind of like the bird's eye view and we can see things differently. And one of the great things was I learned that the projector, the projector can get in two to three hours a day, can get done the equivalent of what a generator would in you know eight to 10 hours. Boom. And I was like, and I was like, I was like, this made some because even in my trip, when I used to be a mechanical engineer, I would literally probably work, I'd say two hours a day, honestly. But I, I could smash out so much stuff very quickly, and effect, and the rest of the time, I, I felt like I was bludging though. I was like, I'm just <laughs> studying on blood. I felt, I felt like I was a bludger. I honestly did, and I was like, but now I'm like, oh, I wasn't bludging. It's just like, I just know more about how my energy type operates. I wasn't bludging before. It's just I'll do my stuff when I needed to do it, and the rest of the time I was actually filling my cut back up. I just yeah. didn't know at the time. I find a lot of projectors like yourselves, a lot of you end up doing things smarter <laughs> as well mm. because you're like, how can I do this easier and not have to take up so much more of my time so I can relax? Exactly. And I guess the manifest is a little bit similar. And same with you, Liv. You're always like, how can I do this? But how can I do it better? How can I have more time? How can mm -hmm. I do this without the hustle? Mm. Which I feel like is such great questions to ask and to dive into. Do you reckon yeah. it, you know, it helped you in business a lot more as well? Do it easier? Yeah, def yeah, definitely. Because the strategies for business, because I actually uh, did an unpack with a business coach uh, who specialized in human design. It's this, the strategies for business is a little bit different because something I learned with the projector is there's something called you've got to wait for an invitation. Mm. So rather than you kind of going out there and saying, hey, I want to work with you or, you know, doing that, as a projector, a better strategy for us is to put our stuff up out there, like this podcast, for example, or a newsletter that I write or a video, and then wait for the invitations to come to you. So you still got to put yourself out there, but rather than kind of like a generator might go out there and just say, ask, ask, ask all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the projector strategy is more put yourself out there and then wait for the invitations, the aligned invitations to come to you. So it still requires work, but... It just, it's just different. It just, it's a little bit different. I love that. Awesome. How good is that? It's just impacted both yeah. of our lives in such an awesome yeah. way. Yeah, exactly, Liv. So I'm glad that you brought up the human design because I think it's a very valuable thing for people to understand and it can just, it can be very liberating like it has for both of us. Mm. Yeah, everyone that I've known that's done a human design reading have said very similar. I'd say 90% of people have said, yep, life-changing. Once they've really delved into their own charts. Yeah. 
Agree, hundred mm. percent. Now, Liv, I want to I want to wind back the clock a little bit now. Mm. Something you said said earlier on because. You said when you got that first property, you could have made an easy decision, but most people would have done and gone and lived in that very first property that you bought, Mm -hmm. but you didn't. And you mentioned a strategy that you use there called rent vesting. Yes. Tell us, tell us about why we know what that is and why you chose to do that strategy. Okay, cool. So this is the biggest thing that holds most people back financially is living in their first home or living in a home that they own. So rent vesting is where simply you as a person, you go and rent wherever you desire to live and then you go and put your money in property wherever the data makes sense. So the reason why that's called rent vesting and the reason why rent vesting, it came out in the early 2000s um, by a, uh, it was a broker back in the day actually. Um, I think it was like Aussie Home Loans, that guy. I'm pretty sure it was him um, that came up with that. Anyway, so rent vesting came out and essentially the reason why it's more financially smarter to not live in a house that you own is for a couple of different reasons. The biggest reason is because your home does not produce income. And so because it doesn't produce income and it requires you to be your little minion to go to your nine to five job to pay it off, it, it's one of the biggest debts that you typically hold on paper, right? A liability technically, right? So technically the definition of your home is actually a liability, not an asset on paper to you right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't produce income. And so when it doesn't, when it doesn't produce income, it naturally brings down your borrowing capacity instantly. So the average Australian would struggle to go and get more houses and more investment properties after that. So, and the other thing is, is all the expenses to maintain that house that you live in is non-tax deductible because it's not Mm -hmm. an investment. So if you live in a house, so I'll never forget when I decided to not live in that house, my mother-in-law, she couldn't understand that. She goes, sweeties, I don't understand why you're not living in that house. And I was like, because, Ma, I it costs me $20,000 less. I say I make $20,000 more if I don't live in it. She's like, how? And I said, okay. Mm-hmm. So there's this thing called depreciation, right, mm-hmm. which is where I could get money back for the value of the house getting older, even though the value of the property is going up. And I said, all of the things that cost to look after that property, if I live in it, I can't claim it, tax time. If I don't live in it and I live in the house next door, I can claim those things, such as the biggest thing is the interest repayments on your mortgage is tax deductible. So that's one. And then things like your council rates, your water rates, your building insurance, all of that was is not tax deductible if you live in it, but when you move out, it is tax deductible. Now, I'm the last person to be saying that you should be investing for tax deductions. I think that should be the icing on top and the last thing you look for. Then the next biggest reason is all of those things, not only are they tax deductible, is they can be added back on to your borrowing capacity to lend more money, right? And then on top of that, that debt that you typically have is usually because you're emotionally attached to that property because it's your home that you desire to live in. There's a couple of things that also happens there. You're like, you end up spending a little bit more on the property, right? Because you're fixing it up. You want to add this nice thing or do this nice thing. So you're not necessarily making the best financial moves from an investment perspective. And then on top of that, uh, what was the next thing I was going to say? I just had a mental blank. That was another one I just lost. It might come back to me. But anyway, a couple of different things there. So that is literally one of the the hacks and it's a tool. It's not a tool that everyone has to use. I get it. People are emotionally attached to their home. I get it. But if you're starting off, the first thing I will do is don't start off owning your own home and don't become emotionally attached. If you're not already emotionally attached, then you're up already. Um, So stay a rent investor is what I would advise any young person trying to start out. And then how does, and then how does that help because you, you, you always say that Aussies get stuck at, you know, two properties or whatever. So yeah. how does rent vest, vest, rent vesting help you then acquire the second and the third easier versus if you were living in the current place? Yeah, good question. I like that you know this stuff, Marshy, to ask me. So um, essentially it's because of the debt, then instead of it becoming non-income producing, it's now becoming income producing. So for, I'll give you an example. So say I had a mortgage for $600,000 and I lived in that house. <clears throat> you are responsible for repaying that $600,000. But if it was on other properties, I could divide that $600,000 
into two houses and buy for the same price, get two for the price of one. So that I could own two houses, right? One for $300,000, $300,000. And now I have got the same $600,000 worth of debt, but now I've got two other families, other people responsible for paying that off. And so that protects your buying capacity a lot more. That's the reason why. Okay. So it's all to do with your the borrowing capacity. Yeah, because so... the number one thing that people get stuck on when it comes to borrowing is getting the bank to give you more money. This is 90%, so in, in, Austra- in the world, but in Australia specifically, um, 90% of Australian property investors get stuck on two properties. So 71% get stuck at one. A further 19% of property investors get stuck at two properties. And the reason being is because they don't have enough, it's all got to do with debt to income ratio. So they don't have enough income versus the debt that they're holding. And so when you are, when you have, like a lot of people say to me, let's let's just pretend I had millions of dollars worth of debt. Let's just pretend I had $5 million worth of debt, right? A lot of people would freak out and be like, oh my God, $5 million worth of debt? That's scary. Well, no, it's not for me because I'd have 10 families paying off that same $5 million worth of debt as opposed to somebody owning, you know, maybe two or three properties. So I'm diversifying my risk of my debt. The bank lacks it as well. And so it enables me to also buy in areas that are cheaper where the rents are higher. So the rents cover more of the expenses because in Australia, people do this silly thing called negative gearing, which is what holds most people back. Yeah. And why is that? Why does, why does it hold them back, Liv? Tell us. Okay. Because negative gearing is where you're losing money every month as opposed to making more money. Um, now there's, a, I don't want to get into the crux of it because it's probably too deep for this conversation, but, um, negative cash flow is okay in the short term. If you have a goal to, to switch over and convert to passive income. Um, mm-hmm. so negative gearing came out in the early nineties, um, targeting the high income earners, like your doctors and your lawyers, right? So those who were already convinced and had trained their mind to say, well, I'm going to be in this career for the rest of my life, high income earner. And so in their minds, they were like, well, the only way to save more money or make more money is to get tax deductions off my nine to five job, which is just locking you into your job more. So Mm -hmm. the reason why it came out and the reason why it's so easy to do in Australia is actually because our capital growth is so good in Australia. We actually have one of the highest, best capital growth countries in the world for property investing. Yeah, okay. like Americans don't get this. And most other people in the in the country don't get this. Actually, we're the only country, here's a fun fact for you, we're the only country in the world that do that do negative gearing legally as well. There you go. Right? Yeah. Other countries are like, what do you mean? You buy properties where you're losing money in cash flow. What they don't understand is that we have a high amount of capital growth, an easy amount of capital growth in Australia. Mm-hmm. So Australians hold on to this hope of like, oh, I'll lose $20,000 in cash flow but it's okay because the value of my property is going up by 100 grand. Now that's okay to do, but not as a full strategy forever, not as a whole business model, which is what I teach my clients. It's okay to strategically add one or two in at this one, maybe at the start to get a lot of capital growth, but with the strategy to quickly transition over into positive gearing strategy. Um, and I guess that's, I guess the thing, because you can only, like, if you're negatively geared, you can only... How many negatively geared properties can you buy? Like there's, there's, a, there's a limit because banks aren't going to lend you money. Plus, if you're losing money, you can only lose so much money. Whereas the positively geared ones, which you teach, mm-hmm. you, can own, you can own unlimited amount because you they're all making money. Correct. So the short answer to that is when you ask how many people can do that, I can tell you right now the stats are, what it comes down to the stats. So it's usually two, yeah. maybe three for a good investor who has a really high income will get stuck at three. So how do you get to only, you only need to get to five properties in order to be the top one. So how do you do that? You need to have more positive gearing strategy as well. However, it doesn't mean you sacrifice the capital growth though, because the capital growth is what actually gets you richer quicker though. So you've got to be, it's a balance of both. And that's, that's okay. what I do as approaches. I teach people how to do that. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to dive into that soon, Liv. But tell yeah. us like to get to that, that, that intention that you had to be a 1% property investor in Australia, to have five properties. Mm. At what point, what age did you actually hit that? 29. 29. So you so you basically bought your first property when you were 23, was it? 25. So, oh, so you bought your first one at 25 and then by 29 you had five properties and you were one top 1% yeah. property investor in Australia. 
Correct. So I bought less than five properties in five years, more than five properties in five years. Yeah. Okay. Now at what, okay. Now where I want to go now is at what stage then you, did you start to realize, Hey, like I've got some skills here. I've got some knowledge here. Mm. Um, I'm in a position now to start actually teaching people to start mentoring people to be passing down my wisdom. At what point in your journey did you get to that stage? Very good. I love this question. So this was this part of my journey. I love it because it's also kind of fresh. Like I'm 32 now at the time of recording this. So it's only two or three years ago that this happened for me. So there's yeah. two pivotal things that happened to answer that question. One was is I had two friends at Optus who were like, show me Olivia. And I was actually actively helping them and inspiring them. So I had a young 20 year old and these were two really close friends of mine who were a little bit younger than me. So I had a 21 year old kid and I'd helped him get to three properties in three years. Um, and then there was another one of my close friends as well. He was a little bit younger than me and he's now like seven properties. He's like, he's killing it. He's same, same about a year younger than me. Um, and I helped them as well. And I was like, I really love doing this. I was so passionate. And I started like talking about, like I would say, put on my socials, you know, every time I got a new property. So I naturally just started having people reach out to me, asking me about how to do it. And what I was noticing was I was taking time out of my work at my job at Optus. And I would say to my boss, oh, I just got to go to the toilet. So I could go quickly help somebody, a friend, you know, help them with their property hurdle. And so I was just naturally like loving the passion of helping people. I didn't know a business model. I didn't know how to do anything at that point though, right? But then one of the most biggest pivotal moments happened. Um, I had sort of worked my way up a little bit um, at this stage at Optus and I became a business analysis, so which is where I was um, working on the Optus app. And I had this mentor in this area and he was the number one business analysis in the world. He'd won like this title. And I was so privileged to be able to work side by side with him every single day. Um, he, again, he became like the next sensei that I ended up asking a lot of theories about life. And then um, I was talking to him about where I was stuck in, in growing in my career. And he'd worked out, he's like, it's because you're actually not really that passionate about it. You're actually just really passionate about property. And so we asked him, started asking me more questions about real estate. And he goes, how many properties you got? And I was like, five I'm, i was at the moment i was purchasing my sixth and he goes yeah. i'm stuck on three and he's like i'm on five times the income of you how on earth are you doing this and then in the property industry at around the same time i was starting to get podcast interviews as well and i would say and you know you'd come to work and you'd, you'd have your team meeting and everyone would be like what did you do for the weekend and i'd be like oh, i filmed a property podcast show and everyone was like all of these directors at Optus who were earning five hundred thousand, um, you know, seven hundred thousand dollars a year, whatever, are just like, how you're doing that? You've worked out how to do that, and I haven't done that. So I just had this moment. I was like, I think I have something here to teach. People who are earning a lot more than me don't know how to do this, and are stuck. I need to teach people how to do this. Um, so those were the two kind of joint pivotal moments that I then um, thought. Then I had this advertisement come up to me on Facebook saying, do you love property? Do you want to teach people how to build a property portfolio? Why don't you become a buyer's agent? And I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. So then I yeah. signed up to this course, whatever. I don't know how much it was, six, $7,000. I was pretty broke because I just I was literally broke as hell. I've always been broke. Every single time I bought the next property, I've had no money because I was reinvesting everything into my property, right? reinvesting myself. Yeah. I actually spent about at this point in my journey, about a hundred thousand, uh, exactly $96,000 in courses I'd spent on my personal development, real estate, stuff like that. Um, and where was I? Yeah. So investing in, in myself, done this course, got into the buyer's agent course. And I was like, this is horrible. This is everything that I am completely against in the property industry that I don't like and that I don't align to. And I got into that. I was like, no wonder the industry is screwed up. Um, mm. So I just didn't align to it. So I ended up stopping that, having a bit of a sook to myself for like three months, thinking, what am I going to do? I thought this was, this is my next thing that I was going to do. So I'm still adopted to my nine to five job. It's all good. But then I was like, hang on a second. I still need a buyer's agent for myself. 
um, because I couldn't keep up with the data and I couldn't keep up with the amount of effort that I put in at the start. I couldn't re keep repeating that because it's so time consuming. The average uh, investor in Australia spends 867 active hours looking for the right property to buy at the right time. 867 active hours. Correct. I learned that from aging, of course. Correct. 860. So much money. Um, Who's got time for that? Bloody hell. Not many people do. That's the reason why people come to me now, right? Most people are too time poor. Absolutely. Um, so I was like, even I acknowledged and said, I can't do this. I don't have the data to buy the amount of effort that I put into defining those two properties, the, the property number two and three. I spent it, and it's the, the data is that 860 active hours is between six to seven months. And it literally did take me six months to do that. Um, mm. And I was hustling just to try and look at all the data. And I was like, I need to outsource this. So it was naturally started knowing that I need to outsource it. So then I went on the hunt again because I'd found, I'd previously used two buyers agents that screwed me over. I, it was horrible experiences. First guy, I paid him like 15 grand, couldn't even get a hold of him. It's a horrible customer service. Ended up asking for a refund, got like half of it back. So I just cut my losses. Um, and second guy um, ended up being a better experience from a customer service experience, but he had zero data on how to actually find. Um, so I outsourced and didn't do my due diligence well on finding the right team for myself. Um, and he ended up buying me a dud. And that property till today, even though it's in Brisbane, I've had it for nearly four or five years now and I've had zero capital growth in that property, even though it's in Brisbane. Which is the reason why I can't just buy anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I was like, I need to find somebody who knows data properly, who's actually investing in this. And then, so then I came across a buyer's agent for myself. I was like, okay, I've got to test the waters. This guy now, I've learned, I've gone through pain of what not to do and who to look out for and what questions to ask for professional services. And then I found this company and I was like, you're amazing. It was ticked every single box that you could possibly look for. Uh, they and I ended up paying them for a second property. And then I was like, hang on a sec. Why don't, instead of me trying to do what they're doing, why don't I partner with them? Mm. And that's when I learned about a thing called affiliate marketing. Didn't even know what it was at the time. Um, and I went to the owner and said, Hey, I love what you're doing. I want to inspire people and teach people the front end and how to do stuff. Yeah. But I need someone to fulfill the, the sourcing for property. And you have a well-oiled team. You had like 40 staff at the time. And I'm like, you have the best customer service. I love your product. I'm one of the biggest advocates. All I want to do is tell you people about you. What about if I refer people to you and you pay me in the back end and he goes done. And I said, I need a title for myself. And till today, this guy is one of my number one mentors in my life. And I look up to him. He's an incredible, incredible guy with one of the highest values. Um, mm -hmm. And he goes, and as I'm explaining to him what I want to do and how I want to help people, and he goes, so it sounds like you want to become like a coach. And I was like, never heard of that word before. And he's like, property coach. And I'm like, it sounds like a cool name. Yeah, let's just go with that. I'm going to call myself a property coach. And that was it. That's where it started. So I just gave myself that. And then I just started marketing online on the side of my nine to five job. So I love that story so much, Liv, because it's, you kind of, through all these years, those 20s, you, you leaned into your inclinations, what you were passionate about, what lit you up. And you got to this point where you were essentially able to create your dream business, your dream career, combining your passion and what you're really talented at and collaborating mm. with someone else. I, I think that's so powerful what you were able to create there. Yeah, thank you. I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. I had no idea. I was just like, I'm going to filter people through to him. And he goes, do you know what this is called? My met the guy at the time, my mentor, now business partner. He goes, yeah, it's called affiliate marketing. And I'm like, what is that? And he's like, go YouTube it. So I did. So that's what I mean by some of my manifestation sort of skills. It's like I'm able to adopt them and just know or copy and paste things, co copy people from a distance and then implement them in my own business. Mm -hmm. And now, so at this point, Liv, when you met this buyer's agent, mm. were you still 29 at this time or 30? Like at, at what stage did that 30. come? Yeah, I was 30 at the time. You so just turned 30. Yeah. And then, so, okay. And that, is that when you really started the coach, the property coaching business about age 30? 
Yep. You know what? So I, I announced it on my socials. I went live. It was my scariest thing doing my first Facebook live ever. But um, I kind of knew the way that I was going to market. I didn't have any marketing. Uh, actually, you know what? I need to take back a step. I became so successful in business very quickly because also you need to be mindful. I had a leg up because of the intention of me moving from department to department at Optus. I had all of these different skills. So I also got to do a marketing course for free at Optus as well, mind you. So I kind of knew about marketing. And then I also knew sales because don't forget, my first 10 years of my life was sales. And marketing sales is typically the first two most important skills that you need in a business right at the start to scale. 100%. Yeah. So, yeah, I already had that leg up. And there was these two women that I'd focused in the coaching space uh, one of shout out to uh, a couple of them. So one of uh, they're a little bit famous, especially in the Gold Coast. Uh, one of the names is Anna Rose, and another woman was Alex Tripod. So these two women who are just sort of focused in the background, they were just marketing like there's no tomorrow on their stories and on their social media. And I just kind of was like, I'm just going to copy what they're doing. They're selling something. I don't know what they're selling, what their product is exactly, but like they're attracting people on social media. And I just knew that, that was something that I needed to do as well. So I just started storytelling on my social media. Yeah, there's a good secret there. (laughs) Yeah, storytelling. Um, Storytelling my own story, but then eventually storytelling other people who had helped for free and their results. Um, Yeah. Yeah, and sharing hacks and tips and tricks, that's all. And obviously the people that I watched on YouTube, they were just giving out information for free. And I'm like, there's some sort of logic here. You just give out everything you knew for free and eventually start getting people in. So I did that. I'm on the side of my nine to five job for about six months. I hustled hard. Oh, and then actually, so I announced it, but then actually something happened, pivotal, is I actually had to completely stop for about six to nine months because I had my own inter- internal uh, mindset blockers that I had to work on. I had fear of judgment of other people, so I needed to get rid of that. And I also had some health issues around my weight as well, so I needed to go fix those two things. So I went and worked on myself, personal development, went hard, like six to nine months on that. Um, then I came out on the other end and then I really scaled my business for six months after that. And, th- and so how long were you working, you know, still full time in your role at Optus until the point that you actually made the decision to quit and go full time on the coaching business? Six months, six months. I went really, really hard. That's yeah. far. That actually, very far. You know what? the decision was actually three months because I'd went really hard for three months made the decision, but then I waited still for another three months. Um, I needed something to push me over the line to say it's okay, it's safe to leave this nine to five job. That was the another big pivotal moment of my life is feeling safe to leave. But I had to watch. Obviously, my money needed to surpass my income, which I did. Um, and I was hustling. I was work, during that six month period. I was working seven days a week, hands down. I said no to every single event. What helped me actually, actually, one of the biggest pivotal moments of my life. This was huge. Moving away from comfort of the surroundings of where I was. What I mean by that is I moved states. I moved from Melbourne to Gold Coast. Biggest impact. I didn't even choose that. I was such in at that time as the start of COVID 2020 and I was in a massive big depression hall and my partner came home and said, babe, we're moving. And I was like, okay, whatever. We'll work it out. (laughs) So we just jumped. And that there was a very big pivotal moment for me to walk walk away from the comfort of the friends that I had as well that helped my business. That is so powerful what you just shared there as well, because the power of environment is huge. And I see this all the time live with people. I'm like, if you if you moved, all your problems would probably change because because in our in the environment that we're in, there's so many habitual patterns and people that we see and triggers that we are coming into contact with every day. But when you move to a new environment, you're not around those triggers anymore. You're not around the people anymore. You're around new places and you actually have to consciously think about your whole life for the first time again. Like I remember when I moved from the country to Adelaide recently live, mm. I had to literally think about where I was going to drive around, what gym I was going to go to. Like it was so uncomfortable and it was the first time I experienced the power of environment and how it influences everything. And I feel like that's actually probably one of the easiest ways for people, not one of the scariest, but easiest ways for people to get unstuck in their life, to get out of the stuff that is holding them back is to be courageous and to move to a new environment that's going to support who you want to become. Because you have to consciously uh, choose everything again. Yeah, well done. I didn't think about that at the time either. Is that consciously? Mm-hmm. The change, the environment, the new stuff. 
I was so attached to also my shadows will be working on was um we all most humans love um community right being a part of something I completely lost moved away from my community the safetyness of everything and anyone my network and networking is one of the things that I love in human connection um and you had to learn the skills to re-network again, find new friends, find new community, find a belonging of some sort. Um, and that gave me more confidence as well within myself too. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Power, so powerful. I think it's one of the best things I ever did in my life was moving into state. Don't matter where you're going to, it's just moving away from the comfort zone. Yes, I agree, 100%. Mm. Um, was that the scariest or the biggest thing that you did in that transition? Was it the move or was it something else mentally that had to shift? Um, you know what? At the time, if I'm going to be honest with you, it was actually just because of lockdown and COVID. It was the pain of being in the, in lockdown so much that was yuck uh, that we needed yeah. to get away from. So originally it wasn't we're up and leaving our whole entire lives. It was in my mind, in my partner's mind, she's like, yeah, we're up and leaving forever. But in my mind, I'm like, oh, we're just going away on a working holiday for 12 months to get away from Melbourne lockdowns. Uh, so we're going towards freedom. But then we were three months in to living in Gold Coast and then it really hit me. We're not moving back. And then that's where my whole entire world collapsed and I really became the most depressed I'd ever been because I had to remove the identity that I'd had in Melbourne because I was very, I felt so comfortable at being known at Optus. Like I'd walk into the Optus building because I was so loved in Optus and I'd, I'm very much a networker and um, social bumblebee. And I'd been there for so long that, like, it was my identity of being the cool lesbian at the at the local office that everyone just loved. Like, one of my problems was um, was trying to work out who I was going to have lunch with because so many people loved having lunch with me on my lunch breaks um, that I'd have to schedule in my lunch break meetings to have different lunches with different people, with different friends. And I was like, I'm never going to have that again. And I loved walking in being like, this is home. And when I had to let go of that after three months of living in Gold Coast, I hit like this real depression hole and I had to pull myself out. There was a few months there where we were like, we were planning on moving back because I was so upset. I was literally crying myself to sleep every night and waking up depressed every morning, shaking, quivering. Like it was that identity that I had to get rid of. So I had to do a lot of um, kinesiology and healing work internally. Yeah. And that, that is probably the hardest part of the journey for anyone on this path um, is the identity work and, and letting go of that old identity, that old comfort zone and stepping into the new one. Because for you, Liv, it sounds like, I feel like we're very similar in a lot of ways. Like it sounds like you were this big fish in a small pond Optus. Like, you know, everyone knew you, you had all this, you know, pe people loved you there, mm. but then you had to make this change and become the small fish in this big, it's vast ocean and be no one essentially. Yeah. And that can be scary as hell. That was very scary. Yeah, the unknown. But it, it, it. I feel like it just creates some sort of strength and stamina in you to push through and to be persistent. Because in those moments, when I felt like I was losing everything that I thought that I was, that identity, only you can save yourself. Mm -hmm. And I had to pull myself out, and I had to do the work. And I went and did the work, mm -hmm. and um, I went to personal development stuff. And the biggest thing was my kinesiologist, I'll have to say, helped me. Oh, now, Liv, tell us, tell us about like what, what does a property coach do? Like where, where, what's the value that you add to your clients and customers' lives? Like what do, what do you do versus say what a, um, a buyer's agent does, for example? What's yeah, great question. Um, so I am a property coach. So I tell people like think of your, your buyer's agent as your doer. Right, so they know where the top one percent data is. They know um, they know how to go up against the sales rep. Um, they know how to build out like they have the the tools and stuff to build out strategic uh, mapping and stuff like that. Whereas me as a coach, think of me as like your teacher or your third party opinion. Right, so I'm there to basically hold the hand of every single person up until the tenants in the door, so that that way you have my opinion sitting there on how to think about money and strategy a little bit different. Because you're going to have, and you want different opinions, right? And you want different ways to think about money. And especially with my, my knowledge around um, uh, inflation and money and currency and stuff like that, it, it helps people become, uh, make it a little bit easier to feel comfortable at holding debt 
um, and fast tracking different like little loopholes and tips and tricks. So I think of myself as like a teacher, how to do things a little bit easier because I had to learn all the tips and the tricks and the hard ways. Uh, so the easy ways to do things and the hacks because buyers agents typically don't know this sort of stuff. They know how to solve properties really great. Awesome. You need them. Absolutely. Mm. But you also need for the average Australian, you need someone to be able to teach you different ways to get around different hurdles because I experienced most hurdles because I was so broke. I was such a low income earner building my property portfolio. So I was forced to and had no other option to learn the different hacks and tips and tricks and stuff. So that can help you with your portfolio moving forward. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's a short answer, coach. Yeah, and it sounds like, yeah, what, what I'm hearing there as well, like a lot of the value is like you're, you've become like the sensei now, like Mr. Muhammad was for you. You're that sensei or mentor for other people. And what you were expressing, because of your experience, all the money you've invested, all the the ups and downs that you've had, you can now collapse time for people. And Aussies are time poor who want to, you know, who want to work with you. So you can collapse that time and give people the shortcut so that they can actually get there much faster than yourself or your mentors, perhaps. Absolutely. Majority of my clients will reach their goal in half the amount of time than what it would for me. Mm. Half. Wild. So for most people, um, where usually it might take 20 years to reach their goal, their financial freedom goal. Most people tell me $150,000 100 or $150,000 of passive income. Um, yeah. yeah, most people that come to me um, would have originally not have met that goal actually at all. But now most of them will be able to get there within minimum of 10 to 15 years. And that's just starting off with a deposit for one property. That's it. And I show people how to right. get there within. Yeah. And if you have more than that, then even quicker results again. So. I love that. Mm. Powerful. Yeah, well, I'm very grateful that you've come into my life, Liv, because, you know, I've, I've shared you with so many people. You've helped some of my closest mates. You've helped some of my clients. Um, whenever anyone talks about property, I'm always like, you've got to watch, you've got to check out Liv. Now, Liv, if people are listening to this podcast interview today, where is the best place for them to learn more about your stuff and what you're about? Because I know you've got a big wait list for your services because you're in such high demand, but where can people start to build more of a relationship with you? Awesome. I'd probably say Instagram or Facebook, whichever social media platform you're on that you like the most, follow me on that one. Um, I do have some cool long form videos on YouTube as well. Um, it's not really at the level that I want, but yeah, just whatever social media platform you desire. Just look up Olivia Ward. Nice. And and Liv, in the show notes today, I will also drop a link to your Instagram page, to your YouTube channel. If there's any other ones you want me to add as well, I'll pop them in. Um, but Liv, I really value you being here today. We've been going for nearly an hour and 40 minutes. I reckon this is oh. the longest podcast yet, Liv. Uh, it's been such a good a good story. But if you could go back in time, Liv, mm. if you could go back in time to that, maybe it's the 15-year-old version of you, maybe the 23-year-old version, the 19-year-old version of you, what's the one piece of advice you would give yourself back then, knowing what you know now? Mm. Network. Mm, network with humans, which is exactly what I did do. I did that because mm -hmm. I learned so much from other people very quickly. I collapsed time because I was curious and I interviewed people. It's exactly what you're doing now, Marshy, with this podcast as well, interviewing people, getting that knowledge. But there's no point in obviously having knowledge without action. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, network net net what's that saying your network is your net worth as well mm -hmm. mm. created relationships it wasn't just from a sales perspective it wasn't just networking to be like i'm going to get something out of this person like a monetary thing it was like i want to give value out of this person and i'm going to give value back to them as well at the same time mm -hmm. like i i just i love the value of meeting and networking and creating a relationship and connection with humans mm. I love that. I love that. So networking, building relationships. And no matter, like, even if you don't have lots of money to start with, like, people can, you can add value to someone's life by just giving your energy, by smiling at someone, by giving someone a compliment, by asking people questions. That can add so much value to people. And even if people aren't earning much and just starting off on their journey, I feel like we all have energy to give and that can pay off in dividends big time in the future like it has for you, Liv. Absolutely. Gratitude. Let's give gratitude back to other people. Say so how blessed you Absolutely. are. 
Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, Liv, thank you so much for coming on to Money Mastery with Marshy for episode or well, the first episode of 2024 dropping on New Year's Day. How good is that? Um, can't wait to see what 2024 holds for you, Liv. I know you know you're just scraping the surface of your potential and what's coming for you as well. I'm honoured to know you and to have, call you a friend. So thank you for your time. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, Daniel Marshall. I appreciate you. And I can just honestly say, just to wrap this up as also, what you were doing about teaching people about mastering your money and your mind, and that is, it is 100% a skill that you need to have. So if you haven't yet reached out to Marshall, but mate, you need to know the sort of stuff that you need because it's the stuff that I knew um, and it helped me too. So well done for everything that you're doing in the life that you're changing as well. Well done. Thanks, Liv. Appreciate it. Bye.